Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to week two of doubt. Um, we all have doubts. We all have things that we're questioning. We have all seen things, just like Maggie was talking about, just like Misha was talking about, that we, we don't love when we look at specifically the institutional church. And what we're saying in this series is we would love to encourage you to lean in and ask questions and deconstruct what's been handed to you with your faith. Now, let me talk about that just real quick and then we'll get back to the institutional church. It's so important that we at some level deconstruct our faith. And what that means is that we ask ourselves the question, what's been handed to us that's good, that's right, that's true, that's beautiful, that's, that's from God? And what has been handed to us that is a lie or misunderstanding or false or a copy of a copy of a copy or something that's twisted or even just downright hypocritical. Now, I think it's important to understand that this is necessary in your faith. You cannot grow in your faith unless you go through this process of a healthy deconstruction and then reconstruction. But the truth is we do that in all of our lives. Many people that are deconstructing or asking those questions are people that grew up in church, people that, people that spent. Maybe that just means Christmas and Easter at church. Maybe that means you were at church every week. Maybe that means you went to a Christian school. Just for fun, how many people went to a Christian school in Saginaw and here, raise your hand? Yeah, Christian school can leave you with a taste in your mouth when it comes to the institutional church. Um, I, know, I know a buddy of mine, a friend of mine, uh, I was talking to him uh, at the Taylor campus and he was like, yeah, I was suspended for two days at the Christian, at the Baptist school I went to because somebody saw me from across the basketball court mouth what they thought was a cuss word and I was suspended for two days. And he was like, and I probably did cuss, but I mean, I was 16. Like what? And, that, and sometimes you spend some time in that kind of institutional kind of church and the politics and the things and the rules and the policies and it leaves you kind of going, eh. And so it's necessary to like deconstruct and ask yourself those questions. But the truth is we do this with everything in our life. At some point when you grow up, you start to like deal with life at a much more complex level. It's like this, many of you had this happen. When you were a kid, your, your parents came to you and said, hey, mommy and daddy love each other very much. And you didn't think anything about it. And you just ran off and you're like, okay, mom and dad love each other. And you went off and ate worms and watched SpongeBob or whatever it is that you did. But then you got older. Maybe you're a teenager, maybe you're a young adult and you begin to analyze your parents' relationship at a more complex level. And you begin to notice the sort of snide remarks they would make or the looks they would give while they were like making toast in the morning or, or like your dad started saying bad things about your mom behind her back or your mom decided to tell you one day for no apparent reason, yeah, well, we haven't had sex in 10 years. And like, and all of a sudden now you're evaluating your parents' relationship and love and marriage and you're asking yourself the question, do mom and dad love each other? I don't know that they do. And it's necessary. We do that with everything in our life. And that's what's happened with everybody's faith is if, especially if you were raised in church, you were taught some very black and white things. God, good, devil, bad. The Bible's always right. Uh, you know, heaven and hell, try to be a good person and try not to do bad things. Like that's basically the faith that was handed to you. And then you get older and you realize it's anything but black and white. And faith is complex and the Bible is anything but simple. And, and then as you begin to look at the complexity of it, you begin to question and go, do I actually believe what I believe? And I, again, I just want to tell you, it's absolutely necessary. One of the big things, one of the big things that will stick out to you then, again, is the, is the church and experiences that you've had in the church. And again, maybe you were raised in church, maybe you went to a Christian school, like what, whatever it was, there was something that left you going, I've seen some things. And I want you to know over the years, this has been a significant problem because people don't ask the right questions. I want to give you some examples today of different, different times in life when people should have deconstructed their faith a bit more. The church without deconstructions looks like this. We'll go back way back in time. The Crusades. Priests literally got up and told soldiers, hey, if you die in the battlefield, it's a win-win. Either you go out and you, you come back a conquering hero or you die in the battlefield and then they promised them absolute uh, absolution. Like they would have an immediate ticket to heaven. 
which isn't biblical, it isn't from Jesus, it isn't true, but it was told to them, and this, uh, people didn't break down what they were being passed on to them. The Spanish Inquisition, great idea, let's torture people uh, to follow Jesus. Selling indulgences, this was a big thing, like literally the church got to a place where they were selling, they were making a huge profit for selfish gain off the people in the church, and on top of that, they were like selling relics, One of the things the priests would go around do is they would sell pieces of the cross of Jesus. Man, if you could get your hands on the piece of the cross that Jesus was actually crucified. And so they would sell these pieces of wood, which of course they didn't actually have the cross of Jesus. But it is estimated that they sold enough pieces of the cross to build the Spanish Armada. Like there is, there is this understanding of people just not questioning, not looking at the institutional church, not asking the right questions. A little bit more modern now, uh, you see cult leaders. Maybe some of you grew up in a church only to later realize, oh no, I didn't go to a church. I was raised in a cult. Anybody at this campus in Saginaw, anybody want to admit to the, like, no, I was raised in a cult. Okay. That's okay. You don't have to tell us. Um, There was abuse and then there was cover up. We've seen this a lot more in recent years, but, the, but it's not just that there's abuse in the church, like everybody knows that bad, but then the people as an institution to protect the organization will then cover it up, which only leads to more abuse. Use of faith for fame, fortune, power. We've seen this corruption, and if you're deconstructing or you have doubts, you're sitting here going, I, I, don't, know if, I don't know if I can even believe anymore. Let me say that again because that's what today's all about. You might be looking at all of the things that you've seen in the church and experienced and you might be going, I don't know if I believe anymore. And what I wanna do today is I just wanna like from an insider's perspective, I wanna unpack why the institutional church always or many, many times ends up with corruption inside of it. Let me give you a really uh, simple illustration. Um, When I first became a follower of Jesus, and this may be how many of you were too, it was just sort of me and Jesus. Like it was at a church and there was a lot of things happening, but it was a me and Jesus thing that was happening. And I I was like rethinking everything and I was putting my faith in Christ and I was following him. And on top of that, I was like trying to reach the world around me. So I shared my faith. I remember sharing my faith with this one guy and it was just an awful display. It was, it was terrible. I said all the wrong things. And yet somehow like God was working in that and he was, God was using me as a way to introduce himself to this other person and I was like, wow, I wanna, I wanna do this with my entire life, right? And so it was very simple. Nothing complex about it. It was just me and Jesus. Well, then I was a part of the church and I got to be a part of the church at a more complex level. And really all that is, is a bunch of people coming together now. And we're, we're all on that same path of trying to follow God and, and uh, do what God's called us to do. But now we're doing it all together. I spent a lot of time on this. I went to Hobby Lobby. This is, uh, there were scissors involved. There was glue. Anyway, just want you to appreciate what I got here. You have all these lives that are together and that in itself just causes complexity. That's it, that's institutional life, that's an organization, that's why your business frustrates you and your boss bothers you and that's just anytime you get a group of people together like that. And our job as pastors is just to just get people on the same page. We want to be on the same page with our orthodoxy, like what we believe. That's why our beliefs are on our website. That's why we teach it a certain way. That's why we have a a biblical grounding. But we also want to get people on the same page when it comes to our orthopraxy, like how we behave. Like we want to be, so it's, it's what we believe and how we behave and let's do that with as much clarity and possible and it gets, it gets so frustrating. (laughs) It's frustrating just to do that because people are like, well, I want to do it this way and I want to do it that way. And, and in the process of just figuring out what we're going to believe and how we're going to behave, there's a lot of feelings, there's a lot of emotions, there's a lot of hurt. Sometimes there's, there's just things that happen. Now, it's frustrating, <laughs> it's irritating, but it's also beautiful. And if you've, you've seen the church at its best probably in some ways, and healthy deconstruction recognizes that, that the church has been at its best at times, and then there's times that it's been at its worst. Unhealthy deconstruction just finds all, all of those times that are broken and unhealthy and not working. But I'm telling you, 
If you lean in, you'll see that this is actually God's design and it is beautiful and the people that you see get baptized and the life transformation that happens in small groups and the people that are genuinely growing in their faith, like God's moving and a lot of times he's doing it not because of us as leaders or pastors or church, uh, church men, but, but almost in spite of us. So it's beautiful and it's frustrating. And it's frustrating and it's beautiful. Now, that's not even the point. That's not what I wanna talk about today, okay? Here's the point. I just wanna go another step farther. And I wanna tell you, one of the things that happens that we just need to be aware of and recognize, that there are also just a few people, leaders, inside of this beautiful hot mess, and you can't even tell them, you can't even tell this, I spent some time, just a few of these dark threads. And these are narcissistic leaders. And I don't use the word narcissistic lightly, like, oh, you're such a narcissist. I mean genuinely, all they care about is themselves. And the church and the body of people that are coming together to do this beautiful thing, the church is extremely susceptible to narcissism in the church. And here's why it's susceptible. Because one, a leader, and that may be a pastor or maybe a small group leader or you know, something like that. Somebody that's already a narcissist is already pulled into the church because, because there's a lot of appeal with the influence and the people and, and it's just a thriving environment for a narcissist to thrive. Or, or the environment of the church actually creates narcissism. And I don't wanna be the guy with the white hat here. I want you to know the reason I'm familiar with this is because I've seen it. I know that being the center of attention or being looked up to or being called pastor or, or the influence that you gain is corrosive. And I think I've seen people over the years that are just really good folks. People you could pull from the headlines of famous pastors, you'd look at them and go, I think they were sincere. I think they were just following Jesus. I think they were just doing good things. And then at some point, it became corrupted and, and the, the influence and the spotlight, it became corrosive to their soul. And so you end up with narcissism. Not a whole full church full of them, just a few leaders, whether pastors, small group leaders, whatever it is. Today I wanna recommend, if you've seen this in the church or this is something you're struggling with, I just wanna recommend a book, Technology. I wanna, hmm, <laughs> there it is. I wanna recommend a book uh, called When Narcissism Comes to Church by Chuck DeGroat. It genuinely talks about that this is not just something that you've, one church has experienced or here and there, but this is a real epidemic in the church and what happens is it changes, it changes the church in general. Now, my point today, what is my point? What is my point today? My point is that you need to understand this, that Jesus is just as upset at narcissism in the church as you are. And if you've seen something like that in the church, or maybe you didn't even know what you were looking at, but you've experienced something like in the church, you need to understand, you don't wanna walk away from something that Jesus is just as upset about as you are. So today I wanna to go through uh, just a few passages of scripture, but I wanna share with you the heart of God that comes through uh, the heart and teaching of Jesus. Before, before there were denominations, before there was Lutheran and Catholic and the Reformation movement, before there was the Council of Nicaea, before there was the day of Pentecost, before the church had even started, even before Jesus had died and rose from the grave, Jesus gave a warning about this. Even before people even knew what a church was, Jesus was warning there's going to be these narcissistic leaders and you need to pay attention. Here's what he says in Matthew chapter seven. Watch out for false prophets. So important to understand this. The church has not even started yet and Jesus is already warning that there are false prophets. Listen to how he describes them. They come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Here's so important to get. Jesus is like, you're not always gonna see them coming. 
Like something, one thing I love about Christians, we got this big heart, very trusting, a lot of faith. We got this big heart, and sometimes we're just not paying attention. He's like, it's going to be very subtle. He says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. I think it's important to like illustrate how this happens. Uh, when we first started the church, that we started Downriver, uh, we were a young. We're a young uh, church plant, and we didn't have much money, and we had some good things going on. We had great children's ministry. We had an okay facility, right? The preaching was fantastic. And, and, um, but, but one thing that was terrible was our worship. Nobody thought our worship was good. Even the people participating in the worship was like, this just isn't good. What we're creating isn't very good. And somehow the church was growing anyway. Well, one weekend, we didn't have anybody to lead. And so I tried to like hunt up like a, a worship leader that I could contract or something like that. And you know, we were new, so we didn't have a lot of connections. Found this guy. He said he'd come for $800 just to do one service. And I was like, oh, that's, that seemed, for a young church planner, that seemed like a lot of money. But I realize it's not that far off. My, anyway, he's like, yeah, I'll come do it. And you could tell right off the bat it was a little bit about the paycheck, but I didn't really care because I needed somebody to come lead worship. Anybody, anybody uh, to do it. So he shows up. I was gone that weekend, and um, the reports back were, man, he just was weird. I don't even remember who this guy is. I don't remember. I think his name was Will Johnson. I don't remember. But he was, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. There's nobody, there's nobody I even, I don't even remember his name. But they were like, yeah, he was just, he was just like all about himself, and he was rude, and he wasn't nice, and he didn't care what anybody said to him, and he didn't talk to people before, and he didn't talk to people after, and he just, he just gave off like a real bad vibe. And then he got up, and he led worship, and he was fantastic, very gifted, very talented. I was watching on Facebook, and people were saying things like, that was the first time that the Spirit moved at this church. And people were convinced that this was the only time the Spirit had moved. And everybody else that really saw behind the curtain, they were just like, never speak to that person again, right? I think it's important to notice that that sometimes I think we evaluate all the wrong things. Jesus isn't saying, are they a talented worship leader? Are Are they a good preacher, right? Do they have all those things that we normally evaluate? He's asking the question, do they actually live like me? Do they behave like me? So he says, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. This is really simple stuff. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. I think sometimes, maybe, I don't, I don't know what it is, maybe Christians are just trusting or everything. We're not analyzing every person and every leader and we're not asking ourselves the question, like what, what is their actual fruit? And do they actually look like Jesus and talk like Jesus and act like Jesus? I'm not talking about perfection, but do they represent Jesus in their life? He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Jesus is warning before he even started the church, there's going to be a lot of people that look the part and act the part, but are not genuinely leaders from me. He says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? Who prophesies? Preachers, teachers, pastors. In your name and in your name, drive out demons. Who drives out demons, right? People in youth ministries, right? There's people in leadership. And in your (laughs) name... And in your name perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. What's my point? My point is, if you're looking at the church and going, man, there's some things I've seen I don't necessarily like at the institutional church, I want you to know that, that Jesus sees it too. It exists in the church. And the last thing he wants you to do is to look at that and go, well, I guess that's... That's reason for me to peace out. Maybe I'll just have church at home. That's what Jesus wants you. Jesus just wants you to have church at home. No, no, he doesn't want you to like walk away from that. He wants to lean into that. He sees what's there. He wants you to to be smart, to be paying attention. What we look at as 
as a sign to leave sometimes, and I'm not just talking about a denomination, I'm talking about the church, the church at large. What we take as a sign to kind of peace out or step away from, Jesus is actually trying to call us into something. He's saying, what do, you, what do you believe? What do you understand? Are you any better if you were in a leadership spot? Were you, would you be any better? How can you contribute to the health of the body of Christ? And we don't need to use it as walking papers, but we need to lean into it and recognize that Jesus is just as angry as we might be at it. And Jesus does, uh, does this quite a bit. Jesus doesn't get angry at, at prostitutes. Jesus doesn't get angry at tax collectors. He doesn't, he doesn't get angry at some of the things that other religious leaders were upset about. Jesus gets angry at one group of people consistently. He gets angry at the leaders of the institutional church, or at the time was Judaism. Jesus sees the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and he, he walks in and he sees the corruption that is in the temple, and he overturns the temple. Jesus, Jesus sees the corruption that's happening, and he recognizes it, and he challenges it, and he pushes back against it. And in one particular scene, at the, the final week of Jesus' life, Jesus has, has been playing things pretty smart. He's been hanging out outside of town. He's, he knows that his time has not yet come. It's not time for him to be crucified. He's been playing things pretty low key. Knowing that he's going to be crucified on Friday, he, like on Tuesday, he comes into town and he's more outspoken than ever. And in a group in public, he finally and fully in Matthew chapter 23 puts the religious leaders on blast. And I want you to hear what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 23, he says, woe to you. In other words, this is a warning. Like I want you to know because of your foolishness and because of your stupidity, I wanna warn you because you are in the, you are in the danger of the wrath of God. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. This word hypocrite wasn't just like being two-faced, but it actually was the word they would use for a Roman mask that they would use in theater. He's telling a group of Jews who hated the Romans, you're just like these, these masks that the Romans, the pagan Romans wear. You are completely two-faced. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not even enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. They raised funds and they were passionate and they told people, man, we need to like make converts. They were very active in their mission. <laughs> and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woe to you, teachers of the law, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. He's, he's imploring his people. He's like, remember, I said, judge them by their fruit. Do you see justice, mercy, and faithfulness in their life? You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Woe to you teachers of the law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and dish and then the outside also will be clean. The matter of the fact is that that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to transform all of us from the inside out. That's the whole gospel. Without that inward transformation, all the outward religious practice in the world is just outward religious practice. But there are people that are really good at acting the religious practice and talking the right language. And he's saying it's worthless unless you actually are transformed by what I came to do. And then he says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything 
unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to be people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you, he's still going. Remember, he's in front of hundreds of people and he is laying these guys on blast. These are the people that have the power to, to hurt Jesus in a very significant way. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. This is such a moment. I want you to catch this. He, he is referencing all of the Old Testament. He was saying, man, all these prophets that were killed, all these people that gave the law, all these people that I sent, they were killed by your forefathers and you're just like them. And he's saying, and so you might as well finish it off, I'm now here. It's no longer the prophets, it's no longer the people that I've sent, I'm here in person and you might as well go ahead and kill me. It reminds me of that scene in Tombstone. I don't know, this might be going back too far. Tombstone's a Western, it was made in the 80s. But anyway, Wyatt Earp's standing in front of the guy and he's like pushing the guy. He's like basically picking a fight with him and he's like pushing the guy and then he says this line, he's like, go ahead and skin that smoke wagon and see what happens, right? I feel like Jesus is in this moment going, okay, you got me here, go ahead and do it. You're gonna kill me? Just go ahead and do it all the way right now. Jesus is testing them, he's pushing them. And then Jesus says this, this is how he kind of wraps up this whole thing. He looks into the future, and I think there's a calling here. He says, therefore I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And that's exactly what happened. After Jesus died and rose again, the church was established. There was so much jealousy, narcissism, ungood. People just weren't leading at all well that, that they were so jealous that they began to pursue the Christians. They began to persecute. It actually got to a point like this has been happening all over human history. You, you can look back over the last 2,000 years and you can see this happen again and again and again. And it, and it always comes from the institutional church. One of my favorite stories is William Tyndale. If you've never heard the story of William Tyndale's life, he had one objective. All he wanted to do, this was his objective in life. He wanted to write scripture in a language that the people could understand. That's all he wanted to do. It was written in Latin. It was not something that the common man didn't know Latin. And so because of that, the church, the institutional church, had all the power and all the control. But he made it written in a language that, that people could actually read from themselves. And because of that, the institutional church strapped him to a pole, burned him alive, and ripped out his tongue because they didn't want that to happen. And Jesus is saying, I knew that was gonna happen. And I'm gonna keep sending people. I'm gonna keep calling people. I'm gonna get people who actually want to know what scripture says for themselves. I'm gonna keep sending them your way. Today, you might see something as a negative, as a reason, your walking papers, be like, I don't want anything to do with that. And actually what God is doing is he's calling you. He's inviting you to read scripture for yourself, to know actually who God is. I think there's a reason that God allows, this is just my best guess, I think there's a reason that God allows narcissistic leaders or leaders like this to exist in the church. I think it's because God wants us to never be confused. You don't follow people. You don't follow men and women. You don't follow an organization. You follow me. And if you can look past them, if you can look past the hurt and the behavior of those people, what you'll find is you'll find me and I'm nothing like them. Today, I want you to hear, instead of a reason to doubt, I want you to hear a reason to be called to lean in. Because this church, 
242, the church at large, the capital C church that exists everywhere, this church, the body of Christ, with warts and all, flaws and all, difficulty and beauty and all of that, and even with hypocrites and narcissists in it. This is God's light in a dark world, and he's calling you. Let me pray. Father God, I pray... I pray that you would help us as we, as we look for you, God, to not let leaders, people, men and women distract us, slow us down, get in the way, be an excuse. God, I pray that we would look past that and we would look to you. God, that we would find you, you and your heart and we would be determined to not look good on the outside but be full of dead men's bones. But God, that we would be sincere followers of you. God, I pray that you would use every person who is willing to make your church what you have called it to be. And I pray that in Christ's name, amen. We're gonna move into a time of next step